Hello everyone, my name is Luca Chiton and I'm the chair of the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. I'm also the managing director and a business lawyer at Boughton Law, a law firm based in the downtown core. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our first ever State of Downtown video. In a typical year, we would host an in-person State of Downtown report launch event where we would have the opportunity to connect and interact with thought leaders from many different industries. But we've collaborated with those thought leaders digitally this year, and we're so proud to share their insights with you through this virtual platform. While last year's State of Downtown report provided an important baseline to assess the impact and recovery efforts post-COVID-19, the 2020 report will shed light on the impact that the pandemic had on our downtown core. From public health to public transit, our speakers will be covering a lot of ground and sharing their expertise with you. You'll hear their insights on the retail and office markets, the tech sector, tourism, and more. One thing we learned this past year is that even amidst a global crisis, there are opportunities for growth and discovery. Although the first year of our new mandate didn't go exactly as we had originally planned, the DVBIA team was incredibly successful in rapidly shifting gears and focusing on our members' top priorities. We look forward to using the insights and findings from the State of Downtown report, as well as other research from our economic development team to inform future DVBIA programming in a targeted and strategic way. And now, without further ado, please enjoy today's presentation of the 2020 State of Downtown. We will begin with a land acknowledgement from Vanessa Campbell of the Musqueam Nation. Siam Nasiya Vanessa Quenasqui e Talitsen Mathquiam Ami Zap Quetquilam e Tanash Mathquimat Tamo Tersh Amit Tas Hunt Kaminam Kan e Tlu Tersh Alaquats to swamp me e to Salil with Hash Mesteo. Ni sin kiltem nasiya quans hunt kaminem kan sasu tu hua aik quat qualoen sta quenas yuanes sat samsen e hilak sto te huinas e mech natin e tap was heath nam ya aiks e aiks tata wet te nimes mesteo e he hasam it na tamo I would plead to Sia's Mark Swale. Hi, Tapka, to swell up Quathi Alep with me at a nawail. I turn a swell in quince eat quits nala. I heal up stala to nuts all moch e ear to e. When I win a wish, Quath no way is. Hi, Tapka. Hi, Tapka. My name is Vanessa Campbell and I'm from Musqueam. It's my honor to join you all here uh, to speak and represent my elders and my community in welcoming you to the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people, a land that we share with our relatives from the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I was asked to speak to you here in Hunkaminam uh, to welcome you to our territory um, and also help ground your hearts and your minds in a good place. And I want to thank the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association for creating a space at the beginning of this video uh, to recognize the history of the land that Vancouver grew up on. Um, and to thank each and every one of you for honoring us by taking a moment to understand what that means for each of you and your businesses. Haitchka, haitsapka. COVID has had a devastating impact on the retail sector. Most challenging though, has been urban downtown centers such as CF Pacific Center that are situated in active business districts. Our traffic is made up of the office population and tourists, both domestic and international. With the pandemic and little to no international travel, as well as up to 80% of the office workforce continuing to work from home, this has had a catastrophic impact on the downtown landscape. 
not just conventional retail, but restaurants, bars, entertainment, arts and culture. Cadillac Fairview's response to the global pandemic was immediate. We had a customer base that was diminishing literally overnight. We had to pivot our recovery plans to mitigate the impact on our retailers. What that really meant was really focusing our resources on leisurely shopping and targeting more local and regional customers uh, to come back downtown and shop with us. Property teams got creative and resourceful and started experimenting with some real grassroots programs. We collaborated with a lot of our business partners. One program that we're offering again this year is a partnership with the Vancouver Hotel Destination Association with a stay and shop promotion, where you receive a CF shop card for a nightly stay at a Vancouver hotel. Another initiative was our Dine Out to Help Out, a reward-based program incentivizing our office clients to eat local and support our CF retailers. And then just little things like discounting our, our parking leading up to the critical weeks before our holidays. We had to adapt our shopper experience with the changing world and COVID. But what we quickly realized is that our customers' needs and behaviors was also shifting with the uncertainty around the pandemic. Their primary concern now was, was our health and they were looking for safety and convenience when they shopped with us health and safety protocols that we put in place was really just alleviating operational impediments. We adjusted our layout in the shopping center to one-way traffic. We designated doors as exits and entrances and created abundance of space in our common area for all the queuing for the stores. We also could track our occupancy in real time. At point of arrival, we converted a lot of our automatic push buttons to touchless sensors our customers could navigate store offerings on their device instead of having to interact with our digital directories. And then leading into Christmas, we had our occupancy levels shown on our website so our customers could check how busy the shopping center was before they planned their trip. And for those customers that simply were not comfortable visiting us in the center, we could facilitate them with curbside pickup we had situated around the property. We have two active redevelopments underway here at CF Pacific Center. One being our rotunda redevelopment on the corner of Georgia and Howe, and the other being the former Four Seasons Hotel. As part of the rotunda redevelopment, we look forward to opening our new main entrance on Georgia Street this coming August. And then once that's opened, we have three new retailers joining us at the shopping center. My outlook for the future is office occupants will return. Uh, hopefully this fall is what we're anticipating. The other 35% of our customer base being tourists, that sector is going to take a little longer to recover. Downtown Vancouver's office market has been impacted by COVID-19 um, in a number of different ways. Um, I mean, first off will obviously be a, a reduction in, in foot traffic, clearly, as office workers were uh, starting to work from home. Um, as a result, uh, you know, we have seen, um, you know, vacancy uh, start to increase uh, in the downtown core, particularly sublease vacancy. Um, we primarily saw that starting to happen probably by mid-year 2020 um, and through the fall that accelerated. The class of buildings that were most impacted by vacancies we saw were older class B buildings primarily. Um, and those tend to be kind of more mid-rise type buildings, you know, 60s, 70s vintage. Uh, that's where the majority of sublease vacancy emerged. Class C buildings, we also did see some uh, vacancy again, primarily sublease uh, emerge in those types of buildings. Class A buildings, which is the majority of the downtown market, just had a slight increase in, in vacancy, so they weren't impacted that much. Um, and our AAA buildings, in fact, uh, weren't impacted at all. Uh, the types of companies that have leased office space in the past year have been varied, but leasing activity has been minimal. Um, most of the deal activity we did see in 2020 were renewals uh, as companies uh, decided to kind of take a wait and see approach in regards to not only their own workforce but what the impact of the pandemic would be uh, and the government's response. Uh, the strengths of downtown's office market are several. One, obviously there's now an opportunity for tenants to take space anywhere downtown whether they're in A, B or C class buildings. There is new AAA space coming online this year. And as a result, there are a number of different and new options for people that have not been available in previous years. Downtown uh, was very tight. And you know some would suggest that it was unhealthy 
that it, the market was as tight as it was because op, uh, companies did not have the opportunity to grow and new companies didn't have the opportunity to come to Vancouver. So some of the opportunities that, that people will have uh, downtown um, include being closer to amenities. Uh, so if they wanted to be closer to say a transit station uh, for, you know, for their employees, uh, to upgrade their space, to get new say change rooms or, or end of trip facilities in a building, say they were in a class B building or C building or an A building and they, and they, and they want to shift up the space, uh, those opportunities are available. Um, certainly, sublease offers opportunities for everybody to get into uh, you know, a downtown Class A building um, at a more uh, reasonable price point, perhaps. Well, I think a post-pandemic uh, downtown Vancouver looks uh, a lot like a pre-pandemic downtown Vancouver. I think it will continue to be very active and vibrant. Uh, we do have a, a, a strong line of new supply coming uh, throughout the downtown with significant pre-leasing, which will bring even more workers here. Um, and I think that there's an energy and a vibrancy that will come with that, particularly the nature of some of those new employers. And as well, I think one of the key things we need to remember is that while the city will have a, 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 do, a new and changing skyline with the addition of these buildings, that the main changes actually won't be visible to the, to, to the eye outside. It will be as a result of the changes that are being made inside buildings and how people use space. And so when you come downtown, it's going to look awful similar to the downtown you know and love, but it's going to be different in terms of how you interact with the space that you enter. Public transit ridership has been severely impacted by COVID-19. At the beginning of the pandemic period, we saw ridership dip to about 20% of what we saw before the pandemic happened. Well, since then, it's rebounded to about 40% across all of our modes, but it's nowhere near what we saw in terms of ridership before the pandemic. We left a, a spot of growing ridership, a very strong ridership, and we are now in a phase where we're gonna have to rebuild that again. TransLink has brought in a slate of health and safety protocols to help keep our customers feeling safe and healthy. We understand public transit is a confined space and people may not be comfortable, but we're doing all we can to help them feel comfortable. And these things include strict, strenuous cleaning regimes. We've even introduced something we call a pit crew, where when trains lay way, we can send a crew of people on the train to give it a quick clean before it goes back into service. And you know, beyond these traditional methods, such as mandatory masks, we're looking at new and innovative ways to keep our trains cleaner. Now, these include things like our copper pilot. We added copper surfaces to some high touch areas on trains to investigate the disinfecting properties that copper has and, and how they can kill organisms on surfaces and had some pretty good results. In addition to that, we're looking at how we can get the air cleaner. Uh, we're piloting a new technology for us called photocatalytic oxidation. Now what this does is it uses UV light and a small amount of hydrogen peroxide to sanitize the air. And we're hoping we can roll this pilot out across all of our assets if it's successful. TransLink's outlook on the future is a bright one. We know right now we're in a period of time that's affected by this pandemic, but it's not going to be this way forever. Soon enough, we'll be able to get back to the places and the people that we love, having dinner with friends, catching a Canuck game with your dad, all those sorts of things we used to enjoy about downtown life. They're going to return, and TransLink services are going to be there to help you get to those places when you're ready. A post-pandemic downtown is a downtown that's easily accessible. You have mobility options, people can get where they need to in a timely fashion, and one that's sort of more vibrant and return to the, the cultural sort of vibrancy that we saw downtown once more, the crowded, bustling nature. And, you know, we're looking forward to being a part of that economic recovery. Uh, downtown Vancouver's tourism has been impacted significantly in comparison to elsewhere because of what we call the triple hit. We have lost office workers coming downtown, residents are not going out as much as they used to, and of course we're missing visitors. We're missing cruise ship passengers, we're missing meetings and conventions, we're missing sporting events, we're missing events and festivals. So downtown has really been the crucible of economic impact. Now, Tourism Vancouver's response to the pandemic was pulling everyone together, and that was in the form of the Metro Vancouver Tourism and Recovery Hospitality Task Force, and it really was about getting the variety of stakeholders, we are an industry of industry, to share information, to try to understand what was happening in a rapidly unfolding scenario where no one scenario planned for a global shutdown of the tourism industry.
Now, there's been no increase in local or regional tourism. In fact, it's the reverse. It's been a decline. If we use one of the indicators, and that's hotel occupancy, we've seen them in single and, and low double-digit occupancies, 10%, 11%, 8%, and that's been fairly consistent since this pandemic started last March. The cruise ship season being cancelled is going to impact us to the tune of about $2.2 billion annually. The hotel sector has been massively impacted by the pandemic. Uh, think about uh, the revenue required from homes, from room stays that, that needs to happen. So we've lost jobs, we've, um, we've lost people out of this industry uh, who are superstars who have gone to other sectors because of it. Uh, hotel closures, uh, as an example. Um, the reality is without the movement of people, it's very difficult to keep our hotels operating in any way, shape or form from a positive perspective. And to be frank, our hotels don't want more subsidies. They want people, they want guests, they want to welcome people again. And that's what we've got to get back to. Now, my outlook for the future is actually quite positive. Now, we have a, uh, an opportunity in front of us once in a generation to rethink about how we want to rebuild and restart our visitor economy in Vancouver. So that's the gift that we're getting given here, and that's our opportunity to get Vancouver back on the global stage. How we partner, how we collaborate, that will be our strategic advantage to rebuilding our visitor economy. I love that downtown has tons of energy. I love that you can find anything, anytime. Uh, you can find cultural events, sports, people. I feel like you can go out on a um, stroll in the beach or have a picnic in the park. I feel like downtown really represents everything that Vancouver has to offer. COVID-19 has impacted our business in every way. We've been open since May 2020 when restaurants were allowed to open after the initial lockdown. And we've had to adapt our operations and our physical space in many ways. We've had to put uh, plexiglass, uh, we've had to distance our tables, we've had to use sanitizing, contact tracing, masks. Servers have to follow a different protocol and these guidelines have constantly changed through, through this year. Uh, they've gotten sometimes more restricted up until now that we had to close again. The post-pandemic downtown that we imagine is uh, one we knew before and revitalized. And keeping some of the stuff that I think COVID has brought to downtown that, are, that is great, like the temporary patios, I think they're great for businesses and for locals and tourists. So I think that we can keep some of what we had during COVID and bring back everything that we're missing. Downtown's retail corridors have been impacted to varying degrees by COVID-19. Uh, Granville was most impacted by street level business closures. At least 29 businesses closed in 2020 compared to 16 in 2019. Foot traffic on Granville decreased about 37%. West Hastings was most impacted by reduction of visitations. But keep in mind that West Hastings is also home to two hotels, English language schools, and SFU Harbor Center. Visitations on West Hastings dropped by about 46%. The Alberni Luxury Corridor fared relatively better compared to other streets. Visitations only dropped by 26%, and there are very few business closures. Downtown visitor demographics shifted during COVID-19. Most visitations in 2020 were by young singles and couples. They also saw the least reduction in visitations compared to other groups. Middle-aged families and large, diverse families saw the greatest reduction in visitations, which is unsurprising since most public events and festivals were cancelled. The downtown peninsula's relatively large population may have helped buffer some of the impacts of COVID-19 on local businesses. The percentage share of total visitations by downtown peninsula residents actually increased in 2020 from 11% in 2019 to 16%. Whereas total visitations by Burnaby and Surrey residents actually decreased by about 43%. Once restrictions are eased and it's safe to welcome people back to downtown, we need to continue to support public events and festivals, especially if festivals that attract large diverse families like the Vancouver International Jazz Festival, Latin Coover, Taiwan Fest and Pride.
makes Vancouver an attractive place for tech companies? It's a wonderful intersection of five very important things that I think are quite critical to all tech economies. First one being talent, where we are one of the most top-rated ecosystems for talent, as measured by the availability of talent, the quality of talent, and the price competitiveness. The second is access to capital, and I'm talking about investment capital, private equity capital, uh, where we have one of the top-rated, again, we are one of the top-rated cities to register an annualized growth of 38% year after year for the last 10 years, which is one of the highest in North America. Third is the livability, where we are consistently ranked as one of the top cities in the world in terms of livability. Uh, you know, we are one of the most diverse cities in the world, in North America, certainly. Fourth is the government incentives and the government mindset to support technology and innovation. And that's sort of evident through the different non-dilutive funding grants that are available from the government. And the last one, it's quite personal, but also quite critical, I think. It's the values-based ecosystem, where we are really an ecosystem of values that is first willing to acknowledge some of the most critical problems in the world, uh, whether that's diversity and inclusion, equity, climate change, uh, zero waste. And then we are wanting to not just acknowledge them, but actively work on solutions to mitigate those problems, which I think is quite a unique proposition and a value add that creates a very wholesome environment for good innovation to take place. Innovation in Vancouver has certainly continued to flourish during COVID, and that has happened across the, the gamut of industries. So whether you're talking about uh, SaaS solutions, or we're talking about life sciences, we're talking about clean technology, it, is, it has happened across the different gamut. Uh, you know, and the key examples, again, that, 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 have, that, have, that have created that global momentum or the global hype or global newsworthy um, sort of status uh, include Trulio, uh, which is, again, Vancouver local homegrown startup working on uh, sort of identification, intelligent identification systems. You've got Thinkific, which is changing the world of online education. Uh, you've got Appcelera. Uh, the organization that is working on drug discovery and certainly pioneering the realm of drug discovery on, on a global standing. Uh, you've got, you know, Galvanize, which got acquired by the Legion for a billion dollars. You've got Mobify, which got acquired by Salesforce. So I feel like quite a few organizations, you know, these are some of the ones that are top of mind because of how much success they've gotten uh, through the last couple of years. So what is the future outlook for tech sector in Vancouver? And I think it really, again, it's an opportunity, a call to catalyze the, the movement to create a city, a future, um, where the tech ecosystem is a part of the city, a functioning integral part of the city. And so it's no longer viewed as the tech sector and the city, which traditionally has been the case, not just in Vancouver, but a lot of other cities. The hard work of our teams has helped BC as a province be less affected overall by COVID-19 and to stay open because we've had easy access to testing. Uh, our prevention has allowed us to have really good COVID safety plans in all of our public spaces, businesses, restaurants, public transit. We have comprehensive case and contact follow-up, which truly does decrease the number of secondary cases from every one case. And this has led our hospitals to be less overwhelmed and for us as a society to be safer. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the opioid crisis in a few ways. The first is that it disrupted the supply chain of the illegal drugs supply. This might initially not seem like it would be such a big problem, but anytime we disrupt those supply chains, um, the drugs that people are using become less and less certain, and we have uh, more unexpected contaminants, and this really increases the risk for those who use drugs. The other really important thing is it it made people fearful of using overdose prevention services or even just accessing health care. So even though we worked extremely hard to keep all of our overdose prevention sites open, to ensure that uh, people could still go to their doctor, we had volumes really drop off because people were afraid. They were afraid of catching COVID. Um, and unfortunately, this has meant more people have used alone. And combined with that toxicity of the drug supply, unfortunately, it really has increased the overdose crisis. So throughout this pandemic, we've done our best to try and target our most vulnerable communities. So that means we have dedicated teams to doing outreach testing. We've dedicated community infection control supports 
to help work with our shelters um, and other housing providers to ensure that they have good COVID safety plans. We've operated isolation hotels for those who can't meaningfully isolate in their own homes. We've provided really a, a quite a network of supports. Um, and we also prioritize these communities early for vaccination. And this has been one of our successes is that uh, we have seen a drop off in, in our homeless and underhoused communities before the general population because of the success of that vaccine campaign. I'm really excited about the vaccine campaign. Um, we've all had a really tough year and I'm hoping that in a few months, we will begin to see life look a lot more normal. The success of the vaccine campaign in long-term care and the success of the vaccine campaign in the downtown east side really does show that COVID can be circulated all around us, but when we have that high level of community protection, the effects of COVID-19 are really blunted. So it's not time to throw your mask. Um, I can't promise you'll be able to hold a big party, but I'm hoping that this summer, life will look a lot more normal. Welcome back. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Charles Gose, the President and CEO of the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. I'd like to say thank you to our speakers today for sharing their time, expertise, and insight from their respective industries. It is through collaboration and key partnerships the DVBIA is able to do so much of our important work, so we truly appreciate those who have worked with us throughout the year to help recalibrate our programs on a regular basis in the wake of so much uncertainty. I'm proud of the work that the DVBIA team has accomplished under less than ideal circumstances, and I know they remain committed to keeping our downtown safe, accessible, vibrant, and engaging both now and post-pandemic. We believe in the long-term economic and social health of our downtown core, and plan on working together with the City of Vancouver and other stakeholders on economic recovery initiatives that will continue to benefit our member businesses and the downtown Vancouver community at large. This year's State of Downtown report will be my last as my upcoming retirement is just around the corner. It has been my privilege to be at the helm of the DVBIA for the past 29 years and I have no doubt that the team will continue to serve our membership with quality, impactful programming. I look forward to seeing their continued successes in our public spaces and streetscapes and beyond. Thank you to everyone who supports the work of the DVBIA. I hope you enjoyed this video. The full State of Downtown report is available for download now on our website, dtvan.ca.